Countdown to Halloween 2022, featuring eerie and uncanny tales of haunts, ghosts, and suspense. Every Monday at exactly midnight, a new story will appear on StoryLink Radio's YouTube channel as we count down to Halloween 2022. You will have seven days to listen, then the next one will appear. Each story will be 13 to 30 minutes long. And now, tonight's story from StoryLink Radio. The Mummy's Curse by Louisa May Alcott, also known as Lost in a Pyramid. Chapter 1 And what are these, Paul? asked Evelyn, opening a tarnished gold box and examining its contents curiously. Um, seeds of some unknown Egyptian plant, uh, replied Forsyth, with a sudden shadow on his dark face as he looked down at the three scarlet grains lying in the white hand lifted to him. Wherever did you get them? asked the girl. Well, that's <clears throat> yeah, a weird story, which will, <laughs> will only haunt you if I tell it, said Forsyth, an absent expression that strongly excited the girl's curiosity. Oh, please tell it. I like weird tales. They never trouble me. Oh, do tell it. Your, your stories are so, always oh, so interesting. She cried, looking up with such a pretty blending of entreaty and command in her charming face that uh, refusal was impossible. <laughs> well... You'll be sorry for it, and so shall I, perhaps. I warn you this beforehand, that, uh, that harm is foretold to the possessor of those mysterious seeds, said Forsyth, smiling even while he knit his black brows and regarded the blooming creature before him with a fond yet foreboding glance. Oh, tell on. I'm not afraid of these pretty atoms, she answered with imperious nods. <laughs> Well, to hear you is to obey. Let me read the facts, and then, then I will begin, returned Forsyth, pacing to and fro with a far-off look of one who turns the pages of the past. Evelyn watched him for a moment, then returned to her own work, or, or play, rather, for the task seemed well-suited to the vivacious little creature, half-child, half-woman. Ah, uh, uh, well, while in Egypt, commenced Forsyth shortly, and continuing on slowly. I went one day with my guide and, and Professor Niles to explore the Cheops. Niles had a mania for antiquities of sorts, all sorts, really, and, and forgot time and danger and fatigue in the ardor of his pursuit. We rummaged up and down the narrow passages, half choked with dust and close air, reading inscriptions on the walls and stumbling over shattered mummy cases, or, Coming face to face with some shriveled specimen perched like a hobgoblin on the, the little shelves where the dead used to be stowed away for ages upon ages. Oh, I was desperately tired after a few hours of all that, and I begged the professor to return. Oh, that he was bent on exploring certain places and would not desist. We had but the one guide, so I was forced to stay. But Jumal, my man seeing how weary I was, proposed to us to rest in one of the larger passages while, while he went to procure another guide for Niles. We consented, and assuring us that we were perfectly safe if we did not leave that spot, Jumal left us, promising to return speedily. The professor sat down to take notes of his researches, and stretching myself out on the soft sand, I, I fell asleep. I was roused by that um, indescribable thrill which instinctively warns us of danger, and, and springing up I found myself quite alone. One torch burned faintly where Jamal had stuck it, and, but Niles and the other light were gone. A dreadful sense of loneliness oppressed me for a moment. Then I collected myself and I looked well about me, and I discovered a bit of paper was pinned to my hat which lay near me, and on it in the professor's writing were these words. And I've gone back for a little for, uh, to refresh my memory on certain points, and don't follow me until Jamal comes. I, I can find my way back to you, for, for I have a clue. <laughs> Sleep well and dream gloriously of the pharaohs. N.N. -N. <laughs> oh, yes, I laughed at first over the old enthusiast. Then I felt anxious and then restless, and, and finally I resolved to follow him. I discovered a strong cord fastened to a fallen stone, and I knew that this was the clue he spoke of. 
Leaving a line for Jamal, I took my torch and I retraced my steps, following the cord along the winding ways. I often shouted, but I received no reply, and I, I pressed on, hoping each turn to see the old man poring over some musty relic of antiquity or other. Suddenly the cord ended. Lowering my torch, I saw the footsteps had gone on. Rash fellow, to lose himself to a certainty, I thought, really alarmed now. As I paused, a faint call reached me, and I answered it. I waited, shouted again, and a still fainter echo replied. <laughs> Niles was evidently going on, misled by the reverberations of the low passages. No time was to be lost, and forgetting myself, I... <laughs> I stuck my torch in the deep sand to guide me back to the clue, and I ran down the straight path before me, whooping like a madman as I went. Now, I did not mean to lose sight of the light, but in my eagerness to find Niles, I... Well, I turned from the main passage, and guided by his voice, hastened on. His torch soon glided my eyes, and the clutch of his trembling hands told me what agony he had suffered. Well, let, us, let us get out of this horrible place at once, he said wiping the great drops off his forehead. Come, I said, we're not far from the clue. <laughs> I can soon reach it, and then we are safe. But as I spoke, a chill passed over me. A perfect labyrinth of narrow paths lay before us. Somehow here I was reminded of the babe, and trying to guide myself by such landmarks as I had observed on my hasty passage, I, I followed the tracks in the sand till I fancied we must be near my light. As but no glimmer appeared, however, and kneeling down to examine the footprints nearer, I discovered, to my dismay, that I had been following the wrong ones, for among those marked by deep boot heel were prints of bare feet. We had had no guide there, and Jumal wore sandals. Rising, I confronted Niles with one despairing word. Lost, as I pointed from the treacherous sand to the fast waning light. I feared the old man would be overwhelmed, but to my surprise he grew quite calm and steady. He thought a moment. Then he went on, saying quietly, well, Other men have passed here before us. Let us follow their steps, for if I do not greatly err, they lead toward great passages where one's way is easily found. And so on we went bravely, till a misstep threw the professor violently to the ground with a broken leg and nearly extinguished the torch. It was a horrible predicament, and I gave up all hope as I sat beside the poor fellow, who lay exhausted with fatigue, remorse, and pain, for I would not leave him. Paul, he said suddenly, if you will not go on, there is one more effort we can make. I, I, I remember hearing that a party, lost as we are, saved themselves by building a fire one time. It seems that their, their smoke penetrated further than sound or light, and the and the guide's quick wit understood the, you, the unusual mist, and he followed it, and, and he rescued that party. So, Paul, you must make a fire now, and trust to Jamal. A fire without wood, I began, but he pointed to a shelf behind me, which had escaped my notice in the gloom, and on it I saw a slender mummy case. I understood him, for these dry cases, which lie about in the hundreds of are free to use as firewood. Reaching up, I pulled it down, believing it to be empty, but as it fell, it burst open and out rolled a mummy. Uh, as custom as I was to such sights, it still startled me a little, for, for danger had unstrung my nerves. Laying the little brown chrysalis aside, I, I smashed the case, I lit the pile with my torch, and, and soon a light cloud of smoke drifted down the passages which diverged from the cell-like place where we had paused. While busied with the fires, Niles, forgetful of his pain and peril, had dragged the mummy nearer and was examining it with the, the interest of a man whose ruling passion was strong even in his death. Come, come, Paul, come help me unroll this. I, I have always longed to be the first to see and secure the, the, the curious treasures put away among the folds of these uh, uncanny winding sheets, eh? This, this is a woman. We may find something rare and precious here he said, beginning to unfold the outer coverings from which a strange aromatic odor came. Reluctantly I obeyed, but to me there was something sacred in the bones of this unknown woman. But, well, to beguile the time and amuse the poor fellow, 
I lent a hand, wondering as I worked if this dark, ugly thing had ever been a lovely, soft-eyed Egyptian girl. From the fibrous folds of the wrappings dropped precious gums and spices, which half intoxicated us with their potent breath, antique coins, and a curious jewel or two, which Niles eagerly examined. All the bandages were, but one, were cut off at last, and a small head laid bare, round which still hung great plates of what had once been luxuriant hair. The shriveled hands were folded on the breast, and clasped in them lay that, <laughs> that gold box. Yes, the one you hold. Oh! cried Evelyn, dropping it from her rosy palm with a shudder. Nay, sweet Evelyn, don't reject the poor little mummy's treasure. I never have quite forgiven myself for stealing it or for burning her, said Forsyth, painting rapidly, as if the recollection of the experience lent energy to his hand. Burning her? Oh, Paul, what do you mean? asked the girl, sitting up with a face full of excitement. Well, I'll tell you. While well, busied with Madame Le Momé, our fire had burned low, for the dry case went like tinder. A faint and far-off sound made our hearts leap, and, and Niles cried out, Pile on the wood! Uh, Jumal is tracking us! Eh? Don't let the smoke fail now, or we are lost, Paul! Pile it on! Well, there is no more wood, Professor. The case was very small and is all gone, I answered, tearing off such garments... Uh, of mine that would burn rapidly and piling them upon the embers. Niles did the same, but the, the light fabrics we wore were quickly consumed and made no smoke. Burn that, commanded the professor, pointing to the mummy. I hesitated a moment, but again came the faint echo of a horn. Now life was dear to me. A few dry bones might save us, and, well, I obeyed the professor in silence. A dull blaze sprung up, and a heavy smoke rose from the burning mummy, rolling in volumes through the passages, and threatening to suffocate us with its fragrant mist. My brain grew dizzy, the light danced before my eyes, strange phantoms seemed to people the air. In the act of asking Niles why he gasped and looked so pale, I, <laughs> I myself lost consciousness. Evelyn drew a long breath and put away the scented toys from her lap as if their odor oppressed her. Forsyth's swarthy face was all aglow with the excitement of his story, and his black eyes glittered as he added with a quick laugh, <laughs> That's all. Jamal found and got us out, and, and we both foresaw pyramids for the rest of our days. But the box, how came you to keep it? asked Evelyn, eyeing it askance as it lay gleaming in a streak of sunshine. Oh, ha, well, I brought it away as a souvenir, and, and Niles kept all the other trinkets. Hmm? Darling, you said harm was foretold to the possessor of those scarlet seeds, persisted the girl whose fancy was excited by the tale and who fancy it all was not yet told. Well, yes, um, um, among his spoils, Niles found a bit of parchment which he deciphered, and, and this inscription said that the mummy we had so ungallantly burned was that of a famous sorceress who bequeathed her curse to uh, whoever should disturb her rest. Of course, I, I don't believe the curse has anything to do with it, but well, it's a fact that Niles never prospered from that day. He says it's because he has never recovered from the fall and, and fright, and I, I dare say it is so. But I sometimes wonder if, if I am to share the curse, for I have a vein of superstition in me, really, and, and that poor little mummy haunts my dreams still. A long silence followed these words. Paul painted mechanically, and Evelyn lay regarding him with a thoughtful face. Ah, but gloomy fancies were as foreign to Evelyn's nature as shadows are to noonday, and presently she laughed a cheery little laugh, and saying as she took up the box again, <laughs> Well, why don't you plant them, and see what wondrous flower they will bear? Ah, darling, I doubt they would bear anything after lying in a mummy's hand for centuries, replied Forsyth gravely. Well, let me plant them and try. You know wheat has sprouted and grown that was taken from a mummy's coffin. Why should not these pretty little seeds? I should so like to watch them grow. Oh, may I, Paul? Uh, no, no, I'd, I'd rather leave that experiment untried. I have a queer feeling about the matter, and, and I don't want to meddle myself or let anyone I love meddle with these seeds. I don't know. They, they may be some horrible poison or possess some evil power for the 
Sorceress evidently valued them, and she clutched them fast, even in her tomb. Oh, now you are foolishly superstitious, and I laugh at you. Be generous. Give me one seed, just one, just to learn if it will grow. See, I'll pay you for it. And Evelyn, who now stood beside him, dropped a kiss on his forehead as she made a request with the most engaging air. But Forsyth would not yield. He smiled and returned the embrace with lover-like warmth, and then he flung those seeds into the fire and gave her back the golden box, saying tenderly, My darling, I will fill this box with diamonds or bonbons, if you please, but I will not let you play with that witch's spells. <laughs> You've enough of your own, so forget the pretty seeds, and come, see what a light of the harem I've made of you. Evelyn frowned and smiled, and, and presently the lovers were out in the spring sunshine, reveling in their own happy hopes, untroubled by even one foreboding fear. Chapter 2 I have a little surprise for you, my love, said Forsyth, as he greeted his cousin three months later on the morning of his wedding day. And I have one for you, she answered, smiling faintly. How pale you are, how thin you grow. All this bridal bustle is too much for you, Evelyn, he said with a fond anxiety as he watched the strange pallor of her face and pressed the wasted little hand in his. Oh, I, I am so tired, she said and leaned her head wearily on her lover's breast. Oh, neither sleep, food, nor air gives me strength. A, cu a curious mist seems to cloud my mind at times. Oh, Mama says it's the heat, but I shiver even in the sun, while at night I burn with fever. Oh, Paul, dear, I'm glad you're going to take me away to lead a quiet, happy life with you, but I'm afraid it will be a very short one. <laughs> my, th my fanciful little wife, you... You are tired and nervous with all this worry, but a few weeks of rest in the country will give us back our blooming Eve again. Have you no curiosity to, to learn my surprise for you? He asked to change her thoughts. The vacant look stealing over the girl's face gave place to one of interest, but as she listened it seemed to require an effort to fix her mind on her lover's words. You remember the day we rummaged around in the old cabinet? Oh, y yes and a smile touched her lips for a moment. And now you wanted to plant those queer red seeds I stole from the poor little mummy? <laughs> yes, I remember. And her eyes kindled with a sudden fire. Well, I tossed them into the fire, I thought, and gave you the box. But when I went back to cover up my picture, I, I found one of those seeds on the rug. A sudden fancy to gratify your whim led me to send it to Niles and ask him to plant and report on its progress. Today I hear from him for the first time, and he reports that the seed has grown marvelously, has budded, and that he intends to take the first flower, if it blooms in time, to a meeting of famous scientific men, after which he will send me its true name and the plant itself. From his description, it must be very curious, and I'm, I'm impatient to see it. <laughs> well, you need not wait, love. I can show you the flower in its bloom. And Evelyn beckoned with a machant smile, so long a stranger to her lips. Much amazed, Forsyth followed her to her own little boudoir, and there, standing in the sunshine, was the unknown plant. Almost rank in its luxuriance were the vivid green leaves and the slender purple stems, and rising from the midst, one ghostly white flower, shaped like the head of a hooded snake, with scarlet stamens like forked tongues, and on the petals glittered spots like dew. Ah, that's a strange, uncanny flower. Has it any odor? asked Forsyth, bending to examine it, and forgetting in his interest to ask how it came to be there. No, oh, none, and that disappoints me. I am so fond of perfumes, answered the girl, caressing the green leaves which trembled at her touch, while the purple stems deepened their tint. Well, now, tell me about it, said Forsyth, after standing silent for several minutes. Well, I had been before you and secured one of the seeds, but two fell on the rug. I planted it under a glass in the richest soil I could find. I watered it faithfully and was amazed at the rapidity with which it grew once it appeared above the earth. I told no one, for I meant to surprise you with it. But this bud has been so long and blooming, I have had to wait. It is a good omen that it blossoms today, and as it is nearly white, I mean to wear it. 
for I've learned to love it, having been my pet for so long. Um, I, I would not wear it, darling, for in spite of its innocent color, it is an, it is an evil-looking plant, with its adder's tongue and unnatural dew. Wait, 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 wait until Niles tells us what it is, and, and then pet it if it is harmless. Um, perhaps my sorceress cherished it for some symbolic beauty, but those old Egyptians were full of fancies. Uh, uh, it was very sly of you, Evelyn, to turn the tables on me in this way. Uh, but I forgive you, since in a few hours I shall chain this mysterious hand forever. Hmm, how cold a hand it is. Come out into the garden and get some warmth and color for tonight, my love. Blithe and beautiful as a spirit, the smiling bride played her part in all the festivities of that long evening. And when at last light, life, and color began to fade, the loving eyes that watched her thought it but the natural weariness of the hour. And as the last guest departed, Forsyth was met by a servant who gave him a letter marked Haste. Tearing it open, Forsyth read these lines from a friend of the professor. Dear sir, poor Niles died suddenly two days ago while at the scientific club, and his last words were, Tell poor Forsyth to beware of the mummy's curse, for this fatal flower has killed me. As the circumstances of his death were so peculiar that I add them as a sequel to this message. You see, for several months, as he told us, he had been watching an unknown plant, and, and that evening he brought us the flower to examine. Other matters of interest absorbed us till late an hour, and the plant was quite forgotten. The professor wore in his buttonhole a strange white serpent-headed blossom with pale glittering spots which slowly changed to a glittering scarlet, and the leaves looked as if sprinkled with blood. It was observed that instead of the, the pallor and feebleness which had recently come over him, the, the professor was unusually animated and, and seemed in an almost unnatural state of high spirits. During the close of the meeting, in the midst of a lively discussion, he, he suddenly dropped, as if smitten with apoplexy. He was conveyed home insensible, and after one lucid interval in which he gave me the message I have recorded above, he died in great agony, raving of mummies and pyramids and serpents and some fatal curse which had fallen upon him. After his death, livid scarlet spots, like those of the flower, appeared upon his skin, and he shriveled like a withered leaf. At my desire... The mysterious plant was examined, and pronounced by the best authority one of the most deadly poisons known to Egyptian sorceresses. The plant slowly absorbs the vitality of whoever cultivates it, and the blossom, worn for two or three hours, produces either madness or death. Down dropped the paper from Forsyth's hand. He read no further, but hurried back into the room where he had left his young wife, as if worn out with fatigue. She had thrown herself upon a couch and lay there motionless, her face half hidden by the light folds of the veil which had blown over it. Evelyn, my, my dearest, wake up and answer me. Did you wear that strange flower today? Did you? whispered Forsyth, putting away the misty screen. Uh, but there was no need for Evelyn to answer. For there, gleaming spectrally on her bosom, was the evil blossom. Its white petals spotted now with flecks of scarlet, vivid as drops of newly spilt blood. But the unhappy bridegroom scarcely saw that, for the face above it appalled him by its utter vacancy. Drawn and pallid, as if with some wasting malady, that sweet young face, so lovely an hour ago, lay before him aged and blighted by the baleful influence of the plant which had drunk up her life. No recognition in the eyes, no word upon the lips, no motion of the hand, only the faint breath, the fluttering pulse, the wide-opened eyes betrayed that she was alive. Alas for that young wife, the superstitious fear at which she had laughed had proved true. The curse that had bided its time for ages was fulfilled at last and her own hand wrecked her happiness forever. Death in life was her doom, and for years Forsyth secluded himself to tend with pathetic devotion the pale ghost 
who never, by word or look, could thank him for the love that outlived even such a fate as this. You've just heard tonight's story from Storylink Radio's Countdown to Halloween 2022. Remember to come back for our next tale. Many more stories of all genres available to listen to and read along with now on our website at www.storylinkradio.com. Visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash storylinkradio. And visit our podcast for easy mobile listening anywhere, anytime. Just search for Storylink Radio on your favorite podcast provider. Oh, and don't forget to hit the subscribe button and click that alert bell for Storylink Radio. Radio.